Well, a blessed good morning to you all. Uh, I pray you had a, a good week. Uh, it has been uh, an amazing week for Mary and I. Uh, we, we sat down the other day and we watched, and, and if you haven't gotten this movie, get it. I'll loan it to you, uh, is the new Jungle Book uh, that Disney put out. And I've always been a big fan of the older cartoon. I mean, I just love Louis Prima in there playing, you know, Louis, King Louis, you know, and, and Baloo, and, and all these great um, portrayals of probably one of the most powerful books ever written, which uh, uh, was The Jungle Book by Kipling. Um, <coughs> the problem in, in the, that I see is, is with this movie, when you go to see it, there's only one human actor in the whole movie, Mowgli. He's the only human in the whole movie. Everything else is computer animated. The grass, the leaves, the tree, the water, everything is computer animated. And our world has come more and more into understanding this truth of sorts. Because the, the producer, Mary and I were watching the commentary afterwards, where in most DVDs now, when you get it, not only get the movie, but you get the director and the producers get to discuss and brag about how they put this film together and how they, you know, the creative design that, that they, they pulled in to make this film the way it was. And it was just amazing when you saw how they made this movie. I mean, here's this young boy who his first acting job ever is Mowgli now in this major motion picture, is walking on this blue screen with foam and so forth that's covered in blue. And as he's walking, he's not in blue. He's wearing whatever clothing he's going to do and the camera's following him and so forth. And then they add in all the computer animation behind it. And at first you're like, oh, I can't believe this. And then there's this one scene where Mowgli goes up to the, the she-wolf who raised him. And it's raining out. And he sticks her hands, uh, his hands, in her hair. And she says, remember, I'm the only mother you can ever remember when you go back to the man village. And the, the, the reality of this, I mean, how it faked us out. You really believe that this little kid is touching this wolf and she's talking to him. I mean, it just, ta-da, you know, a magician's trick that, that spooked you up, a type idea. And in this, then, we start to see this, this beautiful story from Kipling that was written so many years ago. And it's from that point on, I believe that that bear, Baloo, can talk. From that time on, I believe that King Louis is talking to me, which is uh, Christopher Walken. And if, you, if you're a fan of Christopher Walken, you'll love this film. I mean, it's just, hey, you know, he's sort of like a gangster ape, you know, or orangutan, or, or what are they, I forget what the term was. Um, but he, he convinced me. I believed it. I then believed I was in the jungle in India. I was watching the story happen before me. I believed Sher Khan when I saw him and his face was burnt. You know, I mean, all this stuff really convinced me. And, and, and the reality is, is that in today's society, we become very cynical at times of reality. Very cynical of reality. In this year of election year, we get all these promises. Oh yeah, if you, know, you, uh, if you vote for me, I'll do this. And you vote for me. We become very cynical, but at the same time, we become very numb to what reality is. And we allow these falsehoods, or, or in this case of the Jungle Book, this computer generation to transform me and twist my reality. I lost track that it was a computer-generated lion. I thought it was a real lion. And I'm not dim, but I'm slow sometimes. But I mean, the reality is, is that's what's happened to us in our society. And I mean, think about it for a second. On our cell phones, we can now, you know, instantly, if we take a picture 
and we post it onto a social media site, that picture is seen worldwide. You know, in the reality of where it is. And we can doctor these pictures with computer programs so I can be sitting there with Ron Reagan having a cup of coffee if I doctored the picture up. And I can say, yeah, I had breakfast coffee with Ron Reagan. He's been dead for so many years now, but you can doctor it up. Our reality is twisted. The same thing holds true, and if you read the screw tape letters by C.S. Lewis, there comes this, this defining moment when Wormwood writes to him saying, convince him that Satan, our father, he calls him in there, is not real. Is not real. There's been poll after poll in the United States where the discussion of, do you believe in heaven and do you believe in hell? And more people believe in heaven than believe that there's also a hell. This is very scary. Satan has won the fight there. If you believe that there's a heaven, I was a, I'm a good person, I'm going to get into heaven because I'm a good person. I've heard that so many times. So I don't go to church, I'm a good person, I'll get it. Right, okay, you keep telling yourself that. In this morning's reading out of Luke 16, the Lord presents a reality for the Jews at the time. That there is a Hades, there is a hell. And there's a chasm between the two that cannot go breached one way or the other. It isn't in like yesterday's football game with Tennessee where all of a sudden the player went up and made like he was going to hit him and he missed him and the player did a good patsy and fell and the player was ejected. Now I'm sure this week as they do the, the, the look at it, they're going to say, oh, this guy, you know, he could have won the Academy Award for a fall. The guy never did get hit. And they'll give him back his playing privileges, probably. In heaven and hell, you don't have an instant replay. There is no, oh, we made a mistake. God doesn't make a mistake. So, in one of the teachings that most of the modern churches have steered away from is the reality of the doctrine of hell. If someone still believes in hell, they're called what? Old-fashioned, out of touch, out of step with reality, foolish or ignorant. Many appealing to rationality and reason tell us that the concept of eternal hell where sinners burn forever is ludicrous and demeaning. It would be very unprofessional of me as a parish priest to be asked to come to the funeral of somebody, to, to do the funeral of somebody, and say, well, I can't because I knew their life. <laughs> There's a few of them I've gotten to say, well, I don't know about that one, because they're all like, he's in a better place. And I don't know. I think of poor Lazarus here, and, and you know, the, the rich man down there just sending down his finger with water. I mean, that's how hot it is that just come down with a fingertip of water for me that I may be cooled off. Others appealing to the nature of God would say that it flies in the face of everything that God is teaching, that he is uh, uh, consigned some people to hell. You know, God is love. Right? We hear that so often in sermons where they have no powder behind their cannonball as they say, God is love. And then the cannonball just goes. Pfft. Others are frightened to talk about in, in how religion tells us that a man is capable of redeeming himself and therefore Every man is working out his own heaven, and there will be a hell for no one. Too often we see that in churches today. Too often we see that. If you're a good person, if you do good things, you'll get rewarded in heaven. The cultists, without exception, have all 
concocted a plan whereby they and their followers can escape eternal damnation and live joyfully in a better world. Even those who reject their plan will either be totally annihilated or will be ultimately be saved because they're part of their religion or part of their cult or part of their belief system. It all sounds pretty good, doesn't it? If you were coming up and somebody saying, hey, listen, you're really busting your tail for nothing, you know? If you join us, we're all going to heaven. If you join us, come on in. Be a good person. Just be a good person. And this is a very universalist discussion. Just be a good person. And you'll be in heaven, sure. That's why most Americans don't go to churches today. Somebody over the 60s and 70s has convinced them that being away from the body of Christ is okay, which is unfortunate. Now, I'm not concerned with what you believe about hell. I'm, I'm, I am, but I am not. I am not concerned with what the world believes about hell. I am concerned, or I should say I'm not concerned even with what I believe about hell. But our focus today will be on what does God believe about hell? Because in the end, it won't matter what any of us think about. The scriptures will prove correctly, and every philosophy and opinion of man will perish. This morning, as God gives liberty, we are going to discuss the truth about hell. If you're going there. This is a wake-up call and your opportunity to do something about it. If you're saved, this is a reminder that billions are hell-bound as we speak. And it's, it's sad, but that's the truth about hell. Hell is filled with a lot of good people. A lot of good people. We present the gospel to them. In, in order to be saved from hell, in this discussion that Jesus gives us right here, if we read back a little bit more in the gospel, he says, you have to accept me as your savior. Not be a good person. Accept me. It never says in this reading this morning that that rich man was a bad person, does it? It never does. But there's a reality check that happens here where the Beatitudes or the, the, the uh, Sermon on the Mount comes to light. Blessed is he. Hell will be filled with real people. And that's the truth. This man was someone's, some mother's son. Possibly he left his wife, his children behind. We don't really know that. But from verse 28, we certainly know he had brothers who were in his mind as he was in hell. And we see this in the Christmas Carol, which we're going to see in probably two months from now, three months from now, playing all the time on TBS or one of the stations. We see this redemptive story that comes straight out of Dickens, borrows it straight out of the Gospel of Luke to talk about Ebenezer and his friend that worked in the, in the uh, uh, accounting books with him. His friend was coming back trying to warn him. And you remember the chains that he had upon his body? The BBC version of that, the old black and white BBC version, is great because that poor actor is like really carrying these heavy chains, you know? But the, the, the reality is that, or if you read, if you watch Scrooge with Bill Murray and how his buddy who you know, used to be the golfer and all of a sudden and his skin has fallen off him and he can't hold a putter anymore. I mean, there's a reality check of somebody coming back and trying to warn us and just as the gospel said in the beginning, even with seeing the sign of the person, they didn't believe. And that's what Abraham says in the gospel. He says, I'm going to send people back. They're not going to believe. If they're not believing scripture already, they're not going to believe seeing this guy coming with, you know, his putter being melted from being in hell. They're not going to believe that. Here's the sad fact. People you know, people that I know, will populate hell. In fact, it may be those in our own household that die and go there. 
Hell wasn't made by man. We know this from Matthew 25. But those who reject Jesus Christ as their personal Savior will go there. And we see this in the end of the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew, 20, uh, Matthew 7, 21 through 23, and also from Revelation 15, 11 through 15. Hell will be filled with real people. People who simply said to God, I'm okay. I don't need you. Then the second reality of hell comes in, that hell contains real punishments. Now, I make each of my students, as we study logic and reasoning and philosophy at Valdosta State, and, and if Heather was here today, she would uh, uh, attain to this. I make them read uh, Sartre's book, uh, No Exit. If you've ever read that play, get it. If you have, I mean, if you haven't read that play, get it. It's a very short play. It's usually with a book called, a uh, play called The Flies. Uh, which is a discussion about occupation of France by the Germans during World War II. But in this, in this book, these people are in a room together, and the real question was, the real, I guess the real philosophical point of the book was, <coughs> hell is other people. The whole time they're in hell, there's three people that are put in the room together who would never live together. They're put in this room together with the most uncomfortable couches. There's no pokers or prodders. There's no like in Dante's Inferno where we have, you know, uh, uh, demons. The, the, the hell is just being, for these people, was being forced to be in a room locked with just them. That's a different way to look at hell. The verbal spars, the verbal pushes. The language used, it could be any plainer that hell is a place of pain and of torment. Many feel that this is symbolic. They had better hope not. They better hope not. Because symbolism is only used when conventional language is inadequate to describe something. The reality is always much worse than the symbol. And here are some real torments that hell contains. And I'll pull this from scripture for you. Hell has an unquenchable fire. We see this in Mark 9, 43. We see this in Luke 16 to 24. We have in hell, hell has a real memory and remorse. We see this from this reading this morning from the rich man. Hell is real because it has an intense, unsatisfied thirst. We see that from the reading this morning. We see that Hell is real because it has a real misery and pain. Again, this reading this morning and Revelation 14, 10 through 11. We see that there's frustration and anger in hell. Luke 13, 28 and also Matthew 24, 51. We see that hell is real because it has an eternal separation. And we see this especially in this morning's reading and Revelation 21, 8. From what? What is hell have an eternal separation from? Everything that is beautiful. And then finally, in hell we see an undiluted wrath. We see this in, in the prophet Habakkuk 3.21. In hell God's fury will be unleashed. If for nothing else, we ought to make everyone want to be saved. What if this isn't true? What if it is? I see this poster all the time when I go down 95. Where are you going tonight? Heaven or hell if you die? Where do you want to spend eternity? Hell guarantees real permanence is what it says this morning. That hell can be avoided through a real promise, it says this morning. So what's that real promise? What's that real promise to guard us against going to hell? It is the acceptance of Christ Jesus into our lives. To accept him as your Lord and Master. Not just a nice guy that lived 2,000 years ago that I think was God's son. And I really, I've heard the story. I'm sort of believing it. 
but I'm really not ready to accept all that garbage yet. I'm still in control. That's going to get you straight into hell. But an honest acceptance that Christ Jesus came into your life, an acceptance that Christ comes into your life and that you're, so you're saved by his blood and his blood alone on Calvary, that you cannot do it all on your own, that you need a Messiah to help you. It tells of a God who will save all who will come to him by his grace. This is how we avoid hell. An acceptance of Christ Jesus into our lives to be our master, to be our servant. In a few weeks, we're going to celebrate the feast of Christ the King of Sunday. Is he really your King of King and Lord of Lords? This is Sunday I preach. Matter of fact, uh, S.M. Lockridge's sermon on uh, That's My King. But all the superlatives that S.M. Lockridge uses that Sunday are perfect. Is he really in your life? And if he isn't yet, start thinking about it. If he isn't yet your Lord of Lords, if you don't quite yet be on board to believe, that's your prayer for this week. How can I accept him more into my life? How can I start to get away from myself and get into what God really calls for me? So think about it. Think about it this week. Heaven or hell? Don't let the world twist your eyes to think that I'm fine. I'm okay. I'll be all right. That's not true. Not without Jesus Christ into your life. He should be your Lord and your Messiah. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.